Okay, dear Carolyn, uh, I just already presented you to our audience in Finnish earlier. So, uh, before, but, but before you start your speech, I would like to say how happy we are uh, to have you here today with us, since it is very important to talk about evidence-based intervention programs and to do implementation research so that we can really know what works and what does not. But after your presentation, we hope that we will have some time for discussion, since this is a topic and, um, and an amazing example of an evidence-based uh, intervention program and a success story that we do not face often. So thank you once more uh, for participating. And it is my honor to give the floor to you. Hi, I just... Um... Uh, got on, so I just heard this end of your um, your speech, uh, Erica. I'm sorry. Um, it is uh, five thirty in the morning here, and I just came back from a trip. So, uh, thank you so much, and thank you for uh, inviting me to do this speech. Um, <clears throat> I will um, do the share the screen in a few minutes, but I just thought that I would introduce you um, to a friend of mine. Um, are, is everybody on? Are you hearing me all right? Yes, we can hear you all right. Yeah, everything is and okay. So um, just to start, um, I'm going to introduce you to Wally Problem Solver. I don't know if you've seen him in Finland or not. Um, and here he comes. Um, <laughs> Wally has been my long-term uh, friend, <laughs> child, who helps me with most things that I do. Oh, he has big feet. I, I was saying I have big feet. Well, you you are. Your feet are kind of holding you down. Oh, do you want to see my shoes? Oh, yeah, I do have big feet. You see those? They're very big. <laughs> uh, so, <clears throat> hi everybody. Um, I wanted to come on and see you in Finland today, but I don't even see any faces, but but uh, I guess I know that you're there in my imagination. Oh, I see Kati. Oh, I see Katya. Oh, well, thank you. Well, I'm so glad to see you because you know, I heard that from Carolyn. Yeah, you heard that from me. Yeah, I heard that, that you're doing some training of parents in Finland. Um, and, and teachers too. And, and I just um, wanted to be that you're working with, with parents and teachers with kids like me. You have kids like me in Finland? Well, I, yeah, they do have kids like you in Finland. Well, the thing is, you see, I'm a little bit wiggly and sometimes I'm a little bit, well, what's that word they use? They say I'm a little bit difficult. Well, what happened, my story is my parents, they went to take this parenting program. And guess what happened? They, my parents taught me all kinds of things. They, they taught me uh, how to make friends and they taught me how to calm down. And they taught me, uh, what did they else did they teach me? How to pay attention sometimes. Uh, and, uh, well, I, I learned a lot of things from my parents. Oh, they taught me to problem solve. And, and that's why I call myself Wally Problem Solver. So I just wanted to tell you that I hope that the kids in Finland, yep, yeah, Finland, that's right. Yeah, Finland, I hope they have the same experience that I did. Because um, I'm a pretty happy boy now. Well, I guess I better go, but it's been, it's been nice to talk to you. See you later. Bye-bye. Sorry, I don't speak Finnish. All right. Okay, there is my friend um, greeting you. Thank you for getting on, the two of you that I do know. That's really nice. Um, and so I'm going to try to go to the PowerPoint presentation now, and I will um, 
share the screen. So we hope all of this works. So uh, we're going to talk today about, uh, let me, I think I had the first slide. Uh, um, I'm going to do a little bit of an overview today of the parent program and teacher program, because I know that those are two of the programs that you have been um, disseminating in Finland. And I'm going to talk primarily um, ab uh, about overviewing the program and then about how we assure the fidelity of the program delivery on the quality dissemination of the programs. So first, just a little bit of background information. And I know that perhaps this has already been presented and I'm so sorry I couldn't see the rest of the presentations today um, because it's the middle of the night here, I wasn't able to. Um, but I'll do this part a little bit quickly in case it was already reviewed today. But we have found that from 12 to 25% of children between the ages of three and 12 have clinically significant social, emotional, or behavioral problems and are a common presenting concern to pediatricians during well child visits. We have found that aggressive and disruptive behaviors in children are starting earlier and escalating in intensity. And of course, during the COVID time, we've seen uh, quite an increase uh, in children arriving in our emergency rooms with mental health problems. About seven to 10% of our children are diagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder, conduct disorder, or attention deficit disorder, anxiety, or autism. Um, these children um, with oppositional defiant disorder and ADHD are at higher risk for underachievement, school dropout, delinquency, violence, and substance abuse. And I mentioned that the hospitalization for mental health conditions have increased uh, substantially. This is one of my favorite slides. It was produced by Tremblay in Canada, and it shows you the trajectory of aggressive behavior worldwide um, is pretty similar. What we find here is an escalation of aggression or and non-compliance, as you might expect, is kind of normal around the time the children are two to three years old. And you can see there the big increase in physical aggression at three. Now, what you notice with this diagram is that some children, whoops, things are moving around. Some children are uh, more aggressive than others, and that's like everything else in children. Some walk earlier than others. Um, some speak earlier, the same with aggressive uh, behavior. Some are more aggressive than others. Um, you can see this top uh, line here that's kind of a purple color um, shows that the children don't um, reduce their aggression, which would happen in most neurotypical children, starts to come down by the time they're age five. Um, but with those children, they stay high, and we see another escalation again during the adolescent period of time. Now these figures and rates are worldwide um, the same. Uh, the, the group that we're really interested in trying to help are these top two and particularly the top um, row, the purple row, um, in order to help the parents and the teachers know how to manage this behavior uh, in order to bring it down into the normal, normal range. And as you can see here, by the time the children are somewhere between five and 10, well, we've got a low rate of aggression um, in children. So this is the, these are the kitties that we want to help uh, give them alternative responses um, other than being aggressive in terms of managing their conflict um, and their uh, mental health, their, their problems. In high income countries, about four to 16% of children are physically abused and 10% are neglected or psychologically abused. So this is looking at the family backgrounds. Uh, in Finland studies, um, you may have different figures, but I found that about 6% of 
Uh, there was reports of 6% of mothers and fathers slapping, kicking, punching, or shaking their two-year-old child at least once in the previous year. Um, the risk for uh, current abuse and neglect is substantial in children zero to five years of age. The other thing we know about parents who are referred for um, by child welfare organizations um, for potential neglect or abuse is that they have less effective child management skills and reduced emotional responsiveness, escalated verbal and physical aggression and less support. That won't be any surprise to you. Okay, so what do we know about young children's uh, uh, brain development? In the last decade or two, we've learned so much more about brain development and that we know that when um, babies are born, their brain development is still under construction in the first years of life. The architecture of the brain is being stimulated and sculpted by the quality of their interactions and experiences uh, with parents and teachers. Um, okay, so the brain, we get the babies, the brain needs to be sculpted um, it, by the interactions that it's getting from parents and teachers. The neurophysiology brain connections can be strengthened during this time and strengthened with more experiences and the way we respond to them with attention and praise and coaching, and they also can be pruned away. So what we want to do is strengthen those that we want to be to the children to maintain and be able to prune away the, the interactions um, that are not very helpful to the children. So there's plenty of research now showing that early intervention can capitalize on the neuroplasticity in early life to make sure that the appropriate neurons are strengthened. Evidence-based programs have been shown over um, three to four decades. Uh, actually, my first study started in the late 70s. Um, to, they've been shown to prevent and reduce behavior problems by increasing parents' positive, responsive parenting and parent-child relationships. They've also been shown to reduce parent depression, stress, and to increase parenting competence. In terms of children, the evidence-based programs have been shown to promote their social, emotional, and cognitive development and to reduce behavior problems. This is um, some data on the US um, and I, I expect the data will not look this way in Finland. Um, but just to tell you what we found in terms of public spending for helping families, uh, we find that in our country, public spending for helping children um, with, with mental health problems increases with age so that you can see we get a lot of spending when the children are 15 to 19 years old. Of course, at that age, these are the children that are involved in the criminal justice system of dropping out of school, uh, involved with violence. So we're waiting a long time for spending um, in, in terms of providing services. I haven't seen, I expect that the Finland data looks very different than this, but you can see this is in sharp contrast to when we have brain development. The maximum brain development in, in terms of the sculpting and the strengthening of the neurons occurs in this first five years of life. So prevention and treatment of, of um, behavior problems and helping parents to promote their children's social and emotional development um, also does reduce neglect and abuse and is a worthwhile investment. Um, any one child that's kept from a life of crime, um, further crime um, is of cost benefit to society. Unfortunately, uh, less than 10% of children with behavior problems ever actually receive a treatment. And young children, I'm talking now, you know, the, the children um, between the ages of, of two and eight, 
Even fewer ever receive an evidence-based treatment, despite all the research that's been around for a long time. What do I mean by what is an evidence-based program? Uh, and I'm gonna present some of the data that's considered um, uh, of important uh, studies. Um, and one is an evidence-based program has at least two randomized control group trials. And the key word here is it has a control group who doesn't receive the program. It has at least one independent replication by somebody other than the developer um, outside of the shop of where the program was um, developed. The outcomes that are presented show change in research-based risk factors. And that's important. Um, for example, we know there's a clear um, relationship between high levels of aggression in young children and later aggression. The studies use reliable measures. Um, that is, they use validated um, report measures uh, as well as observations. And that's one of the key things many of the studies don't have. We want to have independent observations looking at the parent-child interactions at home and in the case of teacher programs at school, as well as assessments that are done with the children, um, psychological assessments, assessing their, their language, their development, their social emotional skills, and that we would see at least one year follow up um, to see whether the program effects are maintained over time. So all over the past, um, I guess, four decades now, I have been developing different uh, programs and researching them at the University of Washington, funded by the National Institute of Mental Health and the National Institute of Health. Um, and this just shows you a number of the different programs that we have available. On the bottom two rows here, these are all parenting programs. Um, and then the third row from the top are teacher programs and then the, direct, the programs directly delivered to children. Um, I will be talking today about, I think I have another slide, a slide about the ones that you're using in Finland. Okay, just a very brief summary of um, the our incredible years evidence-based programs uh, is that we've done 40 years worth of research now. I started with the parent programs in the 80s um, and, and did randomized trials with them and then proceeded to add on other components to see what would happen if we added a teacher program as well or a child program as well. I began with doing treatment trials and by that I'm referring to trials for children who had um, oppositional defiant disorder, ADHD, but had a, a diagnosis. So the, the studies, treatment trials were with the diagnosis. And as you can see here, I did nine randomized control trials. Then I proceeded to do prevention trials, and that was to take the programs to um, high risk populations. And in my case, I took them to uh, schools that had uh, a high percentage of children who were on free lunch, which meant that they were living in poverty. And I did with the parent program four randomized prevention trials. Around the world, there have been at least 14 uh, independent randomized trials from seven different countries, Canada, England, Finland, you can see is on there. And I'll talk about that in a minute, Holland, Norway, Portugal, Spain, and Wales. Uh, while I won't be talking about the uh, child programs today, just for you to know, there's been three randomized treatment trials, two prevention trials, which we have done in my lab. And there have been three uh, independent randomized controlled trials from four countries. For the teacher programs, we've had three trials by, by my own, um, team, and there's been seven independent trials from different countries, uh, five countries. I have a plus sign in a couple of places there because I don't always have 
the latest. I try to get the latest studies, but um, there may be another one or two. Um, so there's been, we certainly meet the criteria uh, for evidence-based trials. Um, our study outcomes have shown increases in positive and responsive parenting and parent-child attachment, decreases in harsh discipline, reductions in parental depression, increased in their self-confidence, and reductions in the clinical levels of child behavior problems, as well as increasing in child social competence and social readiness. Two thirds of the children previously diagnosed are, have been found to be in the normal range at our three year and 10 year follow up times. One of the very good studies that was done on a 10 year follow up was done by uh, Stephen Scott. Uh, in England, and that would be one you might want to look at. You can find almost all of our studies on our website, or at least you can find the abstract. So if you go to the library on our website and put in, it's easy to use, you can put in one word such as um, aggression or um, autism or, you know, toddler, and you will have the different studies that have been done with that population will be summarized, come up for you, and then you can click on them and find the abstract. In many cases where we've had permission, you can find the entire uh, article so you can take a look um, at the studies. These include not only our own studies, but other, other independent replications as well. So I wanted to highlight the Finnish study by Pia, which is a fantastic study, um, really adds to our knowledge base. Uh, she used the group-based parenting program uh, to improve parenting um, behaviors and, beha and children's behaviors. Uh, and in her case, what she did that was unique was that she did the treatment model um, and offered the program to child welfare referred families. Plus she added the home coaching model of delivering the program. Um, so this was a really um, great addition to our understanding of the program. Um, she came out in 2021 with a long-term um, report as well. So I refer you um, to her studies, which are also uh, in our library. Another study uh, has come out um, just this past year by a doctoral student in Spain, um, also with the child welfare setting, and she found, she gave them the basic program um, as Pia did, plus she added the small group Dyna Dinosaur program. Uh, and her study is just coming out um, various versions of it. Uh, finally, we did a study in New York where we uh, combined training the foster parents uh, along with the birth parents. We, um, we combine that both with the parent program in the first study and the parent and the child program in the second study. Since most of our prevent, all of our prevention studies were done with Head Start, which is a preschool or daycare setting uh, for specifically designed and federally funded uh, for families living in poverty situations. We, I did find that in those studies, about a third of the children were involved with child welfare services. I also want to highlight though, that um, about two thirds of the parents, despite the poverty, were doing extremely well with their children and their children were doing well as well. Um, so not all children um, living in poverty um, are suffering um, from abuse and neglect. Certainly um, parents are doing uh, very well dealing with um, disadvantaged situations. Thanks to the Finland government for investing in incredible years parenting and teacher programs and for making research progress um, possible. Uh, my data show that about 800 group leaders have been trained in the incredible years basic preschool and school age programs. 65 have been trained in the um, 
teacher classroom, the Incredible Years Teacher Classroom Management Program. We have 15 accredited group leaders there, and I hope that we will get more. 13 are in the parent and two in the teacher. We have two accredited peer coaches, and we have one mentor in training, who's Nina Simona. Um, and um, I hope that many of you know your coaches and your, and your mentors. Okay, so of the different Incredible Years programs, these are the ones that Finland has been um, rolling out and uh, evaluating. The preschool basic program, which is for children three to six, the school age program for children ages six to 12, and the teacher classroom management program. Um, we're hoping that we can get um, places to move down in age to start programs to our disadvantaged populations as soon as possible um, in the baby and using the baby and the toddler program. So the goals, I think I've pretty much um, reviewed in terms of what our objectives were are. Uh, just a bit of a summary here. We're improving the parent-teacher-child relationships and attachment, improving the parenting to be um, less harsh. We're also trying to increase the parent and teacher social support um, amongst each other, which is why we do the groups together so that we can build the support network and reduce their stress. We want to increase and improve the homeschooled communication um, and promote children's social competence, emotional regulation, problem solving, and school readiness. It is my belief that by doing building that foundation in the children of being co socially competent, self-regulated, and being able to problem solve, that they will be better able to learn in school and that we will have improved academic outcomes as well. We want, of course, to prevent and reduce and treat social and emotional problems in young children. And ultimately, the long-term goal is to reduce conduct disorders, school dropout, delinquency, violence, and substance abuse. So when you get the program, what do you get? Um, there is a comprehensive leader manual, which you can see here. I think it's seven or 800 pages, so it's very detailed. Uh, you can get the program with the video set or D with DVDs or USB or now streaming is available for the program. Uh, you'll get the parenting book, which the new edition came out a couple of two years ago, um, has been completely updated. Uh, we get some stickers and some books for the children on problem solving as well. And the collaborative book, which is the book for the group leaders is the really important book for the people that we train to deliver this program. Same, um, you get the same set of things, although it's different DVDs and a different group leader manual for the school age program. Uh, and this is what your pyramid looks like in uh, Finnish. And so you'll get the program um, elements of it in Finnish. The handouts are all in Finnish, for example, and you can get those on the website. So um, how do we promote um, engagement and logistics with the program? Some of the things we do with the families, this is for the parenting program now, um, is we do interviews prior to the group. So in our Head Start studies, we actually visited all the families at home. We helped them do the assessment measures um, and, and to begin to develop relationships. We found out a lot, of, a lot of things by doing the home observations about the families. In fact, I would tell you that over 60% of the parents told us that they had been sexually abused and they had not told other people. So this was the beginning of, of relationship building with these um, child welfare referred, they weren't all, this was Head Start. So this was our prevention study actually. 
we have about 10 to 12 parents per group. The um, partners are encouraged to, to come to the program. Um, that's very important. We want to have another person who's involved in the child's life attend the meetings. This could be the grandmother, it could be an auntie, uh, a boyfriend, whoever else, girlfriend, whoever else um, is attached to this child. Because what we find is that where the parent has the support of someone else, one of my studies showed that the sustainability of the results were greater when we did a one-year follow-up. That is those families who had a partner involved um, had, more, had better effect sizes and better outcomes a year later. They were able to keep the strategies going. We offer the programs at day and evening. Well, I will tell you that our clinic programs were mostly evening and weekend in order to get the families when they're not working and to be able to get partners involved, we found we had to do evenings and weekends. Um, oh, for example, our Vietnamese families always came in on a Saturday, on a Sunday, we had to do Sunday groups. So we really try to find out when the parents are available and, and set the times for our trainings accordingly. The parents will meet weekly for two hours for a minimum of 18 to 20 sessions for our high-risk populations. Promoting engagement also involves some other things. Um, we have two leaders um, in the program. They can come from backgrounds in psychology, social work, nursing, education. We uh, help the parents to make buddy calls. That's to call, we set them up with a buddy from the group where they can call and have a, a brief check-in with them, they might be assigned to share how they, what social coaching they used that week, um, how, what their success was through that, or how they set a rule um, in their family or and, uh, brought about a routine. So they are asked to share something. They don't have to be on the call for longer than five minutes. Oftentimes they ask if it's okay to be on longer. Those calls can be done in person. They can be done by Zoom now. Um, they can be done however it is convenient for the families to check in with the family. Uh, the group leaders themselves also call the parents once a week um, just to have some personal um, discussion about how they're doing with the assigned home activities or anything else that the parents want to tell the group leader that perhaps don't want shared in the whole group. And those are really important um, calls. Uh, the um, other thing that isn't on here is we do do makeup sessions. If they miss uh, a session, we can do makeups. We now, with because of Zoom and because of COVID, we can do the makeups online. We can show the videos online. Um, we can also, with our, buddy, with our leader calls, we can do a little practice between the parent and the child online. So we have more options um, in being able to do this, I think, in, in, in better ways. In addition, for our in-person groups, we do find, we do provide food and transportation to um, get to the sessions. Um, and we do provide uh, childcare and we do provide incentives for participation. For the online, we try to provide other things that we think will engage the family. So we send them home little packets, perhaps a puppet. We send them home handouts if they don't have printers. Um, some cases in some agencies I've worked with have actually sent dinners home, um, but we do whatever we can to promote relationships um, between the parents and with the group leader for the online trainings. So how do we, what are the methods and processes that the Incredible Years programs use to promote fidelity delivery? By fidelity delivery, I mean quality of the program. It's being delivered in the way that it was meant to be delivered. And I'll come back and talk about that a little bit later today. Our programs are developmentally based. So as you could see from the boxes that I showed you, we have um, the, the baby, the toddler, preschool, school age. 
which are developmentally based for the developmental task of that age. So for example, we aren't talking to toddlers about problem solving. Um, so uh, we have different um, evidence-based strategies that we use according to the developmental level of the children. The programs are trauma-informed. Um, if you haven't seen the papers on that, uh, during COVID, I did put a number of papers um, on the website for you to take a look at. The program is are culturally sensitive. And as, again, you might see some papers on the website on the transportability of the programs to many different countries, many different cultural groups. Uh, for example, we're in West Bank doing our program in Arabic. So if you have any Arabic speaking families there in Finland, you can find the handouts for those on the website and the handouts for any other cultural groups that we have uh, worked with um, over the years. So every time we do a new study or involved in consulting with a new country and we develop some translations of the handouts for the parents, um, we make them uh, available to everybody. The program really emphasizes the therapeutic relationship between the group leaders and the parents and the parents and, and their children. We um, have a collaborative process, and I think this is why the program is so transportable across different cultural groups, because we begin with what the goals are for the parents. We want to know what they want to achieve. Um, whether or not that is they want child in bed by a certain time, somebody else maybe doesn't care about bedtime, but wants more compliance or wants their child to do better in school or wants to deal with their, their anxieties and their fears. Um, we are teaching principles of behavior change and they are applying those to the specific goals that the parents or if it's a teacher program that teaches themselves have. With principles training, we're teaching them about what it takes to bring about behavior change. Um, just to some examples of that are the modeling principle, what parent models for the children is what they learn. What they give their positive attention to is what the children learn and that's what strengthens those neuron connections. The program is based on a coping model. <clears throat> that is, we don't try to master one thing and then wait till that's mastered to go to the next thing. We start with one component of learning and we build on that, but we're always reviewing the previous learning strategies. So that by the time we get to handling this behavior, we're still working on all the coaching methods, social coaching, emotion coaching, persistence coaching, and praise, as well as adding components in, in terms of managing misbehavior with for example, distractions and redirections, and depending on the age of the children, problem solving. The other methods, uh, IY methods and processes, which I think are so important and in some ways are a component of collaboration, is that we use video modeling methods. So the video clips, which are two to three minutes long, are used primarily as a tool to trigger discussions um, to, to trigger problem solving. Um, so a parent might say, my child doesn't do that or look like that. Then the group leader is gonna say, how does your child look or act? How can we use this principle or can we use this principle with your child or in your setting? So it's important to understand that these videos are not used like you normally would sit and watch a movie um, they're, they're mediated by the group leader to pull out the key aspects of how we set up, how we target the behavior we want to give to attention to, how we give it, how we reward it um, with the responses. It uh, doesn't have to be anything like the specifics of the people on the video itself. Um, it's just the video is just used to learn, to teach the learning uh, steps. We do a lot of practice and rehearsal um, now, more the better. Um, so if a parent says, my child would do such and such, um, would talk back to me in this way, we'll say, okay, let's try it out. Let's be your child. Let's, let's figure out how we're gonna respond to that. So the practices make it real, bring it home to the parents 
And we do the same thing with the teachers as well and are really important. We focus on the cognitive affect and behavior changes and attachment equally. Um, just as I'm just as concerned about the thought processes for the parents, the feelings of the parents as the actual behavioral uh, behaviors that they are using um, with their children and building that positive relationship with their children. The program itself has weekly goal setting. So the parents decide what they can achieve that week. Um, maybe, they can only, maybe they can only do the play practice, but can't do the reading that week, but they have some decisions to make about what they think are realistic goals for them. Um, and then they have weekly practice activities that are recommended. Um, and we reward them for the steps that they make in achieving their goals. The group support is a powerful part of the program. And it was one of my early studies where I tried to evaluate the program without group support and found that the effect sizes were not as good. I also tried to evaluate the program without video. And we found that the combination of the group support, the video and the, the um, trained leader had higher effect sizes. Those are all randomized control trials that were done um, in the 80s and early 90s. The program is sensitive to socioeconomic barriers and that's something that's really key. Um, and I think I mentioned earlier, we, we provide dinner um, for the families and daycare and transportation where needed with our economically disadvantaged families. So I thought that I would show you just a little bit of a video. And this is a group in Seattle where we have four different languages represented. Um, I believe we had Amharic, Tigrinya, Arabic, Vietnamese. I might be missing one. Um, I trained the um, translators, the interpreters, uh, for this program. So we had to go through that with them first. And then we put them all together. And I just wanted you to see, this is a Head Start family uh, group. I wanted you to see how this works. I know you won't be able to, uh, my interpreters won't be able to translate the Tigrinya in Arabic, but um, just to get a sense of how this worked. I will tell you that all of these families came in thinking they were different from each other thinking that they didn't have much in common and ended the program being friends, feeling like they were all on the same page in their terms of their goals for their children. They wanted them to be successful in school. They wanted them to be attached to their culture and their heritage. They wanted them to have friends. Um, so they ended up finding out that they had more in common than they did differences. So let's just see if this works here. I hope it will. Remembering to, two things, to use the descriptive language and to let the child take the lead. So are you the mom? Yes. Okay. So you could just be describing, you know, even the colored items that she's picking up. Oh, I think you're looking at that uh, orange color, right? Yeah, Portugal. I think you're picking the orange color. That's nice. Kullum t'adil t'biya malakhi. Gali l'kum shalla kinta shmi. You could just say, turned it around. Oh, wow, nice phrase. It's black It's brown It's a bug, yeah. Sharing and other social skills like trading or taking turns, those can all be described. And again, it goes back to our attention principle. If you give that behavior attention, you're going to see more of it. So how did that go? It's good. So it's Sarah okay. said it was okay. Yes. Sophia? Sophia says it feels good too. Okay. Yeah. Good. Edmund says it's a little weird. Okay. <laughs> You're the first honest person. Honest. <laughs> it does sometimes feel weird. It's like trying anything new. You have to practice, practice, practice until it feels comfortable. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't see you. So it's a little disconcerting to me to be talking to my computer, not seeing any faces at all. Um, but I hope um, that that video gave you a little bit of a, 
an idea of how we do these programs with multiple languages and how comfortable the parents become. I think one of the key to success with that though is having well-trained interpreters um, and we, they actually become, as you could see, they're kind of partners when we're doing the practicing, they're coaching the practicing as well. So they become kind of co-leaders in many ways. So as I mentioned this one earlier, um, we work on the behavioral skills, the cognitions, reducing the negative thoughts that they have, um, the, helping replace them with positive coping thoughts, helping them understand temperament of their children and themselves, helping them understand the developmental milestones for a particular age range, such as the difference between toddler and preschool and preschool and school age. We help them manage their emotional responses. Um, I, many of you, you might not know this, but I developed the advanced program after I had my own children. Um, and the advanced program of the parenting goes, is, is post basic, but it goes with dealing with depression and anger management, how to problem solve, um, how to build support systems. Um, I have incorporated some elements of advance into the basic, but there is the advanced piece of training, the advanced program we do do for our treatment model. All of the families get that. It, it also helps them know how to problem solve with teachers and how to set up uh, family meetings. So we are helping the families cope with their unpleasant emotions um, and their anger and develop the self-care strategies that they need and how to build themselves from pleasurable activities. Um, we really teach them the link between the cognitions, the feelings, and the behaviors, and that we have to address that link. So as we change the uh, cognitions, we can change the feelings, which we can change into more positive uh, behaviors. This you will know, those of you who are familiar with cognitive social learning um, will understand this. So this is just an example of talking about the basic milestones for the preschooler, which are emotional self-regulation skills, secure attachment uh, for discovery and exploration, and building, starting to build their social and their friendship skills. So for each age range, we look at what the developmental milestones are to achieve during that time. Uh, the goals of the program are um, at the bottom of this pyramid here that I showed earlier are to help the parents understand developmentally appropriate and nurturing practices and to build the coaching. So big part of the program is this coaching piece of persistence, academic, social, and emotional coaching, as well as the child-directed play to promote academic readiness and praise and motivation. So this in essence is the foundation of the program and must be built in a strong way. I, I can't say that enough. A lot of times people will want to bypass that and get directly to the managing misbehavior. Uh, and really that's always a bit of a disaster because unless we have a strong foundation, a strong relationship in place, and we've taught some of the replacement positive behaviors, the discipline piece will not work. I'm gonna just show you a little bit of one of the videos for those of you who haven't seen it, it is in Finnish. And this one is about uh, academic coaching. Um, and so we'll just see that piece. A variation of descriptive commenting is called academic coaching. This is when you describe things that will contribute to your child's school readiness and reading readiness. Everything, Mom. Everything, Mom. Yeah, there's for lemon. This can include counting numbers or naming letters or shapes or colors or objects. This is orange on purple. The objective is not to pressure your preschooler to learn these things, but to just describe them when your child is interacting with them as part of your child-directed coaching. Let's watch how the parent we saw earlier uses descriptive and academic coaching instead of question asking, and look at the difference in her son's response. 
Well, there it goes, Connie. It's getting tall. You've got the one with circles. And that one's got rectangles on it. There's some rectangles. No, uh-oh. Oh, did that make you mad? You say, no, thank you, Nika. You want the big box? Okay, we'll say, Nika, big box, please. There you go. You're being very patient. Oh, are you giving her the little one? Thank you, Kalani. You were sharing. You were sharing your boxes. Yes, you're going to do a big tower. Nika gets a little box. And you've got one with birds on the outside. Look, look at that. It's a red fire engine. That one's going inside. That one's going inside. Oh boy, and look, it has a big tiger on it. Rawr. A big tiger. And that one has a rabbit and a two. Whoops. I think Nika wants to play with your boxes too. No, Mark. You can say, wait, please, my turn. <laughs> My turn. That's right, Nika can take a turn. We can give her a different toy. And a spoon. What else do we have? How about a little cup? Oh, you're putting them in. Did it fit? Oh no, now what? That's it, Kalani took it out. Oh, they're all going in. You're making them all fit. You stacked them all in. Yay, Kalani, you did it. I'm so proud of you. You kept trying. You got them all in. All right. High five. <laughs> <laughs> Oop, there's an eight. I see a number eight and some red diamonds. Oh, this is going to be a tall one, Kalani. Mm. Are they going way up high? Make a tall one. That one goes in. That one has the banana on it. And that one's number four. And you're putting them all in. Number three. Do you see number two? And number one. different ways, Kalani. That's a great way to solve your problem. This next one, which is also very cute, um, is a mother who has three children. She has the baby on her lap and an older child you can't see. And the little girl, Soleil, is trying to um, pull some tape and cut some thick tape, which is really frustrating for her. It would be frustrating for me too. Um, and the mother um, tries to use both emotion coaching and persistence coaching. Emotion coaching combined with persistence coaching can help to build children's self-confidence and ability to stay calm when frustrated. Let's watch this happening in the next vignette. Think about what makes this mother's approach effective. All right, that's good. Yeah, I'll cut it for you. I'll hold it for you while you cut it. Here. Might work better if I hold it like this. Mari. Is it hard for you to cut it? Oh, look. What did you do? I cut it. You cut it. Are you proud of yourself? You seem to be I'm really more. proud about your work. I'm more. Morning, You're working really hard. You cut it again. And this time, uh, you I really, did you did it. Seem to be really happy about your work. And working very hard. You are being very patient with this cutting process. But, 
And you know what else? Yes. It seems to be getting easier and easier for you. See how patiently that you were with that? You worked really patiently, and now you've got three tapes there. Try and try again. One more. You are very focused on your work, too. That's what I'm noticing. You you're working. Better? Do you like it? How do you feel about that? It's good? I'm glad that you like it. Are you getting frustrated with the tape? No? It's a little more difficult when it's longer. What's the matter, so Larry? It's really happy. It's, here you go. Sometimes I know it can be frustrating when the tape gets stuck together. It's good that you're keeping your body nice and calm, even though you're frustrated and you're. There we go. Still yes. working oh, at sure. it. And being very patient. So, Lay, you are working so diligently with that tape. I am really... Mad? No, not at all. Sad? No, not sad. Good? <laughs> I'm impressed. I'm impressed because it's not easy to cut this. This is a very, very sticky tape. Sticky. And you've been getting a little bit frustrated, but you're still working hard to get it done. And you're keeping your body nice and calm, and you're calm. And Mari? And Mari's not calm, she's crying. Um, the top layers of the pyramid are getting into the predictable routines, um, the schedules um, for the children. Um, we do know that the more predictable the schedules helps children to feel safe and secure. Um, of course, it's not 100% of the time, but you know, if it, they can usually rely on that, it helps them. Um, we, we talk about consistent discipline approaches um, for misbehavior. And a big part of this program now is emphasizing the um, self-regulation skills, how to take deep breaths, to calm themselves down, how to go in their turtle shell um, to take deep breaths and think about their happy place. And for the um, children that the preschool children, school age children, we do teach them problem solving um, and do quite a lot of puppetry work now in terms of imaginary play so that we can use the puppets uh, for, I mean, my, if I'd known I wasn't going to be able to show you the videos, I would have brought more of my, my puppets. Or maybe I have one I can show you. Okay, just a second. Okay, I don't know if you can see this. Can you see? Hi, I'm Tiny Turtle. And, well, you know, I learned something that when I get kind of, oh, a little bit, that sometimes a little bit sad. I just go in my shell and yeah, I have a light, I have a light in my shell too. I have a night light. And when I go in my shell, I take deep breaths. Okay, kitties, can you take a deep breath with me? I'm going in my shell. 
that came across or not. Um, but the idea is we use the puppets because of course, children this age between the three and eight are into their imaginary world and big times and preschoolers are kind of not even sure what's real and what's imaginary sometimes. And I do believe that getting into the imaginary world with, with these children is one of the most intimate places you'll be and they will tell you all kinds of things. I found this with the work that I'm doing with kids on the autism spectrum. I can do so much, get so much more language. I'm so much more interaction with using these pup with using the puppets, so much more communication. Um, so the puppets can actually be like the adult or like the parent. The puppet can describe what the child's doing. The puppet can do the emotion coaching uh, or social coaching or persistence coaching. The puppet can can describe the child when they're persisting, but the puppet also can have a little bit of frustration and work through that frustration. Maybe the puppet's afraid of something and learns how to manage that fear. So the puppets are powerful for children this age. Um, and then the other part of the program is to promote the parent-teacher collaboration, working together on any um, behavior plans um, with that. Uh, goals for the children, um, pretty much, um, I hope I have mostly described, but uh, we work on the secure attachment, the emotional expression, the self-regulation skills. Uh, I haven't talked so much about social and friendship skills, but we are really working on practicing those in the child-directed play times, how to wait, take turns, ask um, those uh, those kinds of friendship skills, how to apologize, how to forgive. Uh, we work on increasing the problem solving skills uh, of the children and begin to, and now it depends on the age. So if you have a three-year-old, you wouldn't do very much. It would be very beginning skills versus if you had a six-year-old, you would be doing more. So we're tailoring to the children's uh, developmental level. We want to increase their compliance and cooperation with parents and teachers, and we want to decrease their non-compliance. Now we know that non-compliance in a toddler is pretty normal, <laughs> but we're hoping that we get to a level of during the preschool time, say a four or five year old, that two thirds of the time we can get compliance. It's normal to be non-compliant about one third of the time. And we want to increase their academic um, readiness. Hmm. Okay. The home coaching program is also um, another way the program can be delivered. Um, we've, I've been talking a lot about doing this in a group format, but the program can also be uh, delivered um, in the home or uh, individually one-on-one. -on -one. Well, now we can do it online, one-on-one -on -one with Zoom. Um, we offer this for parents who can't attend the groups due to the schedule difficulties or to do as makeup sessions um, if there's been illness or conflicts. Um, sometimes we offer it in addition um, for, and this is what Pia did in her study was combined it with the home coaching program. So if they're having difficulty with a particular skill, we can do the home coaching and do more practices directly with the child. Uh, for our state, which we, we do this program with our child welfare referred families in the state of Washington, I recommend at least four home visits in addition to the group approach to practice the different elements of the program. Um, the other reason, the other nice thing about the home visit is if we need, we've had a referral from child welfare and you know, we next the next group doesn't start for three weeks or something, we can get started right away with those families um, without having to wait for the next group to start. 
Um, this was just to tell you some of the recent parent program innovations. We now have a protocol for offering well baby um, during pediatrician visits. Um, the attentive parenting program um, was developed for all parents. Um, it's um, really a great program. It has much more, and I know you don't have it in Finnish, so I don't want to frustrate you by showing this, but I do want you to know about it because if you have families that can speak some English, I really would recommend this one, especially if you're doing prevention. It's up-to-date videos. It has a lot of information on teaching self-regulation and on teaching children how to do problem solving using the puppets and using the Wally books. Um, lots of coaching too. So co the components of our, all the coaching methods, self-regulation, problem solving. The autism program um, for working with parents also um, is now available. And um, uh, New Zealand has taken this one on in a big way. And they did a report, the University of uh, Canterbury did a report on it. You could find that on our website as well. So parenting training, I think, is the single most um, effective strategy for preventing behavior problems and promoting children's social and emotional development, but it's not the only strategy. And of course, you know that in um, Finland, you've taken on the uh, teacher classroom management program as well. Um, so there are two teacher programs. The teacher classroom management has substantial research on it for many years, it's been around for a long time, it had one update. Uh, the incredible beginnings teacher program is for teachers of children ages one to five. Uh, and that one is, um, if you're interested in that age range and going younger, um, that one I would recommend for children five and on, teachers of children five and under. And then we have the autism one, which also um, is being rolled out in, um, New Zealand. So the teacher program comes with some of the same kinds of things. It's got its own book for the teachers um, and sort of different posters and a, a group leader manual. Uh, the findings for the teacher classroom management program, you know, continue to come out. I've had at least two more studies um, during COVID time. We did one um, treatment, that is one uh, randomized trial with teachers of children who were diagnosed. So it was used as an adjunct to the child and the parent programs where we found significant improvements in teacher behaviors as well as child behaviors. And we found that compared with just doing the child program only or just the parent program only, we got enhanced uh, outcomes in terms of child academic and social competence and further decreases in behavior in the classroom. So with the parent only, you may get decreases in aggression at home, but you may not necessarily get changes at school. So combining the child program or the teacher program with that, we did get the changes in the classroom. So I think for those children that are what we would call pervasive, has significant problems at home and school, it would be good to combine the parent and the teacher program. You don't have the child one, but those two would help the outcomes. Um, these are the studies that have been done for the prevention population. We did two randomized trial with our Head Start population, and there's been seven independent replications. Um, again, finding reductions in classroom aggression, and increases in social emotional competence and increases in school success. Um, these are some of the studies <clears throat> that have been done. And can you see a lot of them are recent? A new one uh, came out from United Kingdom in 2019, looking at teacher perceptions um, of change in their children. Um, so there's a number I would refer you to Renke, um, if you're going to look these up on the website, Web Renke, who did this in primary schools and has done a whole series of great studies. 
another one in 2020 um, with the T TCM program in primary school. United Kingdom, I would refer you to work by Ford and her team. Um, and they always seem to be doing further research there as well. Norway has also done um, study with the teacher classroom management. And you can look at these, these studies too in 2018, 2019. Uh, recent one that you might take a look at came from Ireland um, during the COVID time. And they were looking at the impact of the teacher program on teacher psychological outcomes. Um, a paper I will refer you to is how the Incredible Years Teacher Classroom Management Program is trauma-informed and promotes students' resiliency and cover recovery, and it is on the website. Credible Beginnings uh, program I mentioned is for younger children. It's um, the newest program. Um, we are doing a study with that um, in uh, New Zealand now, and I believe that Ireland may is saying that they're gonna start one uh, this fall. We talk a lot in this program about um, how we're the optimal um, brain connections that we're trying to strengthen in the program. Um, many of the, much of the content will seem somewhat familiar to you, but it is developmentally based for younger children. We cope with managing separation anxiety as children are brought into daycare centers for the first time. A lot of work on language development um, with this coaching as well, um, how, how these, these daycare providers or childcare providers can work with parents and how to build their, how to really reduce their stress and build their social networks. So teacher training in the classroom has been shown to reduce aggression and increase their school readiness, their social and emotional competence and it increases the effects of outcomes, of child outcomes when combined with peer training. Are there more solutions? There are, and those are the child programs, which I don't have, you don't have in Finland, so I'm not covering those today. So fidelity, what is that? It is referring to the quality or the integrity of program implementation. It's often used in a lot of different ways, but it is the degree to which the program is delivered as it was designed in the original model. What it means is the important components are adhered to. In other words, all the core components are shown. They don't leave out, they don't just go to handling this behavior and leave out all the coaching. The dosage of the program, the frequency and the length of time is um, adhered to. The quality of using the methods and processes that I talked about earlier of mediating vignettes and setting up practices and giving home activities, those are adhered to. The participants are engaged, they're involved, and the program is tailored according to the population served. So sometimes it's the age of the child, sometimes it's the degree of risk of the family, um, the context of the community and the family are really important. The belief that a little bit of intervention is better than none is not true. You would be better um, off not doing it. We've done some studies where we've looked at reduced dosage and we've not seen the same effect sizes, the same outcomes. Um, mostly the number of sessions that I've recommended from our research is the minimum. And oftentimes we have to have more times. For example, if we're dealing with new immigrant families and we're dealing with translators or very high risk, we may need a few more sessions. The effects have been, uh, the outcomes have been uh, increased as the number of sessions attended. Um, so we really work hard on attendance or make up sessions because we know it makes a difference. We have also seen that consultation and accreditation leads to increased fidelity of program delivery. Agencies have told me that when their group leaders were accredited, their dropouts went down. So some research shows that for prevention, depends how prevention is defined, but 
um, significant effects occur for those who attend nine or more two to three hour sessions. Um, for treatment, we found larger reductions for those who had been in 20 sessions versus 10. Incredible years, what is, is our role? We are here for consultation, um, for reviewing accreditation applications, for helping agencies uh, develop their, um, identify possible coaches and mentors, for providing ongoing support. Um, we do review all trainings that anybody does, any mentor does, are sent to us and we review them to make sure that they're following the training protocol and that the evaluations are positive. And we continue to update and improve those protocols and developing programs. Um, we consult with agencies and funding sources to assure that the program is delivered with fidelity. So when a new program starts out, we suggest that they consult with us to determine their readiness, whether it's the right program for them, um, whether they have a realistic support plan, a realistic budget, um, which includes training and evaluation consultation, um, and plan, help plan what, what evaluation they can do and planning for scaling up. Um, there is a, a, an article on the website about scaling up that I highly recommend when we're working with agencies that they read that. How to build up their own supportive infrastructure um, with group leaders and coaches and potentially mentors. So we're trying to build a culture of program fidelity within your agencies. Um, we want to have only group leaders who want to do group work, who like it, who've chosen to do this, they haven't been mandated to do this, um, that they get the official accredited training um, with the program, um, that the new group leaders and the teachers have the time and support to learn the program um, is important. A lot of times it's just added on to an already heavy workload and they don't have time to do the prep that's necessary or watch their videos and evaluate how they're doing. Prioritizing peer support within the agency, um, how they can support each other and get consultation, um, which we now can do online. So it's so cool because we're doing consultation. People are sending us their videos of their sessions um, and we can do that online with families. Okay. We do have a, a pyramid. I'm looking at my time, so I'm going quickly also for administrators. And I know you can't read it because it's so tiny, but it is on the website. And this is trying to, the things we try to help with the agency uh, administrators understand um, how they can provide um, organizational support and make sure that they're ready when they take on an evidence-based program, such as one of the IY programs, um, how they can support accreditation and how they can assure that they're doing the program with fidelity, we, we recommend that they do at least some brief assessment pre and post and um, build that supportive infrastructure. What do we know about its adaptability? We know it's adaptable to different cultures and different family risk factors. The historical development of the program embodies attachment and tailoring that's embedded in this collaborative process. It's, the model is designed to include adaptation and tailoring to local population, to goals, to children's varied developmental levels and diagnoses. Ad appropriate and beneficial, or what I call evidence-based adaptations, do occur when language and cultural and family adaptations are made, when it's tailored to the child's level, developmental level, when home-based intervention or classroom coaching is combined with the group approach for the high-risk families or classrooms, when the number of sessions provided is increased as needed for some populations and translation needs, and ongoing booster sessions and programs are provided to maintain and sustain effects for high-risk populations. So we're not thinking that 18 sessions were all done with that family if they're a high-risk population that they will need ongoing boosters and supporting uh, support. 
Non-beneficial adaptations occur when the program is shortened, the key content is left out, when certain IY Incredible Years methods are left out, such as practices aren't done or vignettes are left out or they don't do the homework and so on. They don't provide the parent book. Uh, if the group leaders are not adequately supported to be able to prepare for it, to debrief their sessions. When the sequence of program delivery has changed, and I mentioned that earlier, maybe they jump to um, discipline without having done the foundation. When the group leaders are not collaborative, perhaps they're more didactic uh, in expert rules, so they're not addressing the parents' strengths. These are all things that are not beneficial adaptations. Programs are being delivered in many, many different kinds of places around the world, can be jails, can be homeless shelters, home, uh, foster parents, home businesses. Some businesses in the US are delivering the program to employees in doctor's offices. So lots of places, schools, um, it's being offered. Um, if we look at, and I, whoops. Uh, I just wanted to show you the picture of the different countries. Um, we're in 20 or more different countries. This is a picture of um, West Bank when I was there <clears throat> offering it to the Arabic a speaking population in a, in a school for children with um, diagnoses. Okay, so this just shows the latest. Um, last Friday, I looked at the latest figures for Finland. Group leaders, you've trained 904 uh, group leaders now. Um, just shows you compared to a few of the other countries. Um, where you are, you're doing really well, um, really pleased. So um, I have said, this is my husband and I and my two kids when I started all, all of this work. But I just wanted to thank the National Institute of Mental Health, Head Start Partnerships, um, National Institute of Doug Abuse, just to acknowledge that they have been the people who have funded my research since the 80s. And I have been extraordinarily lucky to have um, that source to do this work. I am Canadian. And while I am not always happy with things the US does, I am um, giving them their due credit for this because I know that if I'd stayed in Canada, I wouldn't have had this kind of research support. So I'm very grateful for that. So research paints a picture of hope and warning. It tells us the importance of providing parents with adequate support systems to help them be nurturing and to have strong bonds with their children. It tells us the importance of teaching children social and emotional skills, especially for those in the higher risk family situation. And it warns us of the risks if we don't provide the environmental supports for child welfare referred families of young children. However, having an evidence-based program is not enough. Good evidence-based dissemination means providing a solid construction foundation with quality training, quality supervision, consultation, ongoing peer support, consumer evaluations, and building a supportive agency infrastructure with accredited group leaders, coaches, and mentors. I have to say that I think Finland is well on the road for building um, a solid construction foundation um, certainly, it, it seems like it's taking maybe perhaps a long time, but it is well worth your time and efforts. Too many evidence-based programs come and go because attention has been not been paid to these things. These are some of our mentors. At, you know, our mentors have um, were, were having before COVID a yearly meeting, um, but that is another aspect of supporting the coaches, supporting the mentors. Um, that we were able to do. Now we do some of it online. It's not, as, as so many things, not quite the same as in person, but still at least possible to do. So I want to thank Finland for um, all of that um, support and building your own and your, your commitment and dedication to building your own um, support system, them, and rolling out the program with fidelity. <clears throat> 